Welcome to the ship room. You're on the air. The first cyber attack was a worm that made it through ARPANET way back in 1971. And for about as long as that, my guest has been fighting these types of threats. I'm joined by the Chief Information Security Officer at John Hopkins University, Darren Lacey. Hey Darren, welcome to the ship room. I've heard you talk about when you look at cyber attacks by the numbers, mm -hmm. it kind of puts every organization at a disadvantage just because an attacker can launch a thousand attacks a day and it just takes one person clicking on a phishing attack to get compromised. So how do you offset that huge disadvantage? Everybody who came up you know, doing information security during the 2000s. They came up kind of from network security. Yeah, perimeter-based security yeah. model. So we learned about firewalls and yeah. intrusion detection and all those types of things. And maybe we did it at devices and those types of things. But what's really interesting is that the, the, the folks before then, a lot of those were crippies. And, and so it's like back to the past, That's right. you know? And so my, my suspicion is that we'll all have to be Crippies a little bit more than we are now. One of the most interesting things you're talking about is, is many in the industry were brought up in that perimeter-based security model, but then as the data started to move outside of the perimeter, it starts to move to the cloud, it's on mobile devices, that model is no longer uh, effective. So I'm curious, when did you recognize that, that the model was shifting? I think that's really useful to think about because because what happened about, well, I don't know, 10 years or so ago, lots of us in the security space, we were gonna do data-centric security. Yeah. We're gonna secure wherever the data yeah. is. And what's actually happened is that we kind of walked back from that a little bit because with the ransomware and those types of things, we're actually now thinking in terms of, well, it's not just the data, it's also these devices left to their own devices could cause real problems. So now it's a little data-centric and a little device-centric, neither of which are perimeter-centric. Right. So it's, so we, you know, so that, that, that there was this model, if you wanted to be one of the cool kids 10 years ago, you said, oh yeah, I'm, I'm not about the stuff or where it is, it's all about the data. Yeah. And then it's like, well, no, it's really about the device. Now we're kind of in this weird state where we have those two things, and then we're trying to figure out the cloud side of it, which is kind of the underlying implication of the whole thing. So it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a uh, three-legged stool that we haven't really worked out yet. The, the obvious, the answer to it is always the same, which is you have to inspect everybody and everything that's getting to things. You have to monitor it and you have to be able to establish the identity that's right. and then react afterwards. So it, the, the answers are pretty much always the same, but the questions are getting really weird. Okay, so you live and work in Baltimore right now. Yes, I do. And I love there's that one show that was set in Baltimore that was so you know popular on cable. What's it uh, called? Uh, I don't know. Let's see. Uh, maybe The Wire, probably. Yeah. No, I was thinking Ace of Cakes. You talked about data protection. You talked about device protection. I think the third leg is also identity protection. As we yeah. talked about mm -hmm. these concepts of zero yeah. trust, you know, it's all about ensuring that only trusted users using trusted devices, get access to data. And then it's interesting because different data has different values. So you may have different levels of trust on users, identities, and devices. Yeah. So how do you think about that? You have the individual, the user, yeah. and the individual's roles, they may show, but even we leave aside the roles. Then we have the device that they're using, mm -hmm. all right? And so you have to match that up in some way. Yes. So you have to match all that stuff up. And then after that, then you have to ascertain risk. Once you've reached a threshold level, where Brad is basically on a device that we think he should be on when he's basically accessing the stuff. Once you've reached that threshold level, then you have to conduct a risk analysis right. that has to go into, then you start doing math of another sort, not creepy math, but you start doing, you know, big time data analytic going into machine learning math. And uh, that's where we're all headed. So we're all gonna do a lot more math than we did in the past. Inside of Microsoft today, uh, just on our commercial authentications, we're doing almost 700 billion commercial authentications a month. And what that allows us to do is have this view now where anytime anybody comes up to ask for access to data like to Office 365, just like you said, we can understand the risk of the user, the risk of the device, we can then bring that together, says what is the holistic risk, mm -hmm. and then take actions based upon what the value of the data is compared to the risk. 
that's what makes you know Microsoft and other big companies like Microsoft so in intriguing in all of this. Because even if you cleanse everything of any kind of like identifiers and those types of things for privacy purposes, you still have this amazing set of data that's that right. none of us have. And I think that's the thing that is changing most right now is in this security world, so much of the security that modernizes is who is iterating on data and learning from that data to then help you as you protect your company. Yeah, I mean, nobody can do it without you. I mean, oh man! You know, it's. You know, I, I would love to hear you say that again. I, no, <laughs> uh, yeah, nobody can do it without you. I mean, the the point is that you have the data that we don't have, and you have you can profile in, in you know in useful non-intrusive ways. You can profile in ways that none of us as customers can. So we need APIs to pull that data down so that we can do things with it and make the ultimate decisions about whether something is useful or not. We have a phone call coming in here, Darren. Hey, welcome to the ship room. I have Darren with me. Uh, who's on the phone? Ah, Brad! Oh, not again. It's your boy, the prodigious EAP. <laughs> well, it's uh, been a while, but I've been looking back into getting into the uh, macabre poem game, if you know what I mean. <laughs> and since cyber attacks are so scary these days, I wanted to try out some new material on you guys. I was thinking Darren can help since we both live and work here in Baltimore. <laughs> I love a good poem. And are, and are you holding a phone? Oh yes, the Wi-Fi here is fantastic since we're closer to the source. All right. I sat one late night, clicking, browsing, architecting and warehousing. When my inbox came under attack, I clicked one link and all went black. That actually was pretty good. It rhymed. <laughs> Next. Here now, networking runs securely, with confidence hard-earned so surely. To the skies I now beseech, with stolen cred, a massive breach. Um, uh, yeah, okay. Yeah, I mean, that's, that's a poem. I, I, sort of. Last one! Our office is oft so busy and kinetic. Our workers fast, parapatetic. I might never have predicted the way someone made our files encrypted. And now we must pay the amount they ask or watch our data turn to ash. You raised the game there. I like the <laughs> peripatetic and ash. I gotta look those you, words you, up. The peripatetic was really good. I like that. Well, I'll, I'll keep workshopping these, but uh, one last question for Darren. As the CISO, you must be critical of every possible attack vector, and a massive avenue for the attack is through the mobile devices that are going in and out of your network. So, how have you chosen to address BYOD, and how do you plan to make that work? The mobile device lifecycle is following a lot of what we saw with other kinds of devices. And what I mean by that is that you start off, everyone goes, wow, this is a problem. And, and we realize that, that security is a second order problem from management. So you've got to have a way of managing the device before specific device security actually becomes meaningful and, help, and helpful. Uh, Microsoft and other folks are basically spending a lot of resources in, in, with Intune and those types of things of, manage, of basically managing mobile devices. In terms of the kinds of threats and attacks that we see, computers are overwhelmingly more likely to cause real problems. So we, we, we've got a little bit of time while we work through device management. And then at that point, security becomes useful. If you throw the security on with, with kind of poor application management, the security tools will, give, will have poor fidelity, they'll break in unusual and interesting ways, and, uh, they, and ultimately they'll create poor user experiences and poor analyst experiences, and people will essentially um, push them to the curb. And that's one of the things we've been working on with Microsoft 365. Having these um, different layers as you're talking about, as you get away from the device or as you get away from the, the user, be integrated in a way that you know you have the flexibility as an IT leader or as a CISO to say, hey, I'm gonna have less fidelity here, so I need more here. And the ability to be able to turn that on or off 
is a a core part as we think about the security that we bring with Microsoft 365 and how that interlays with the management. Security is also a state of mind. You're going to operate better in the world if you feel safe and secure. So while we've been talking, we have a ship room um, learning bot and it's been watching, listening to the conversation, analyzing it. And it has come up, believe it or not, with the 12 most relevant questions that we should end the show with. But just to make things interesting, you work with a lot of doctors now, so let's gonna see who has the steadiest hand as we're answering the question. Is it weird that the CIA is on Instagram? Yeah, it's weird. But what's one sport you just can't care about no matter how hard you try? Uh, lacrosse. How many of the nine Supreme Court justices from 1979 can you name? Rehnquist, uh, Marshall, Brennan, White, Wizard White, Blackman, I, I want to say Douglas? What uh, zoo animal would you be the least excited to ride? I don't think I'd run around a ch ride a chimp. Ah! <laughs> uh, I think he might have lost. Well, Darren, thank you for being here. You know, if people want to learn more about you or more, more about John Hopkins University, where would they go? www.jhu.edu. Thank here. you for having me. Hey, thanks everybody for being here in the ship room. We'll see you on the next one. Are we taking it from the top? How do you make that work? <laughs> Me? Oh, I'm, I'm originally from Baltimore, same as you. My mother was raised in Little Rock, <laughs> Arkansas. Hey everyone, now that you've watched this episode of The Ship Room, I really recommend that you go to microsoft365.com shift and learn how to get started deploying Windows 10 and Office 365.